Hi, Stanford. How are you? Good. How are you, Colin? Um, yeah, so we're back. Yeah. This we week we're talking about control. C is for control. Um, so yeah, from my perspective, it's all about to order, to limit, to rule something, or someone's action and behavior. So my first question to you, Colin, why control? Why are we talking about it? Well, the question is, is, is for me, is what's in our control? What's not in our control? How is control exerted on us? Who is actually in control? What do we mean by control? And we have things like out of control, phrases like loss of control, control freak, controlling. We have all these different ideas with regard to control and are we ever actually in control? And I think that control is a very interesting thing because actually as we get into points of instability and uncertainty within our lives and also within the world, we start to look at what it is we have control over. And actually we find that the there is a an effect for our personal wellness for things that we thought we had a sense of control over, but we didn't, and how that affects us as well. So I think that for me, control is in several aspects. One is the control of our body that we take for granted, the control we exert through our minds, the control that the environment has on us and that we have over the environment, and also the control that we exert on other people and other people exert onto us and so I want to explore this this subject matter because at the moment we're in a kind of we're in, in quite an interesting space and the space is one where we've moved through a pandemic into um, an awareness of a, of a war going on at the moment and into a financial crisis and it, it, all of these sort of things have created an awareness for all of us in different ways with regard to the understanding of control. And so I just wanted to kind of use this subject matter just, just actually as a method to understand all these different relationships from the point of control and also to see what happens when, what, what's the effect on us with regard to control? What's the effect on other people? How, you know, how do we feel these effects? You know, so for me, the concept of control is interesting, you know, it brings up a lot of questions. And then when we start to look at something spiritually as well, is who is ever in control? And so I kind of want to begin to explore those areas, um, you know, just have a chat about them. And if any of you guys um, who are listening to this, watching this, if you've got any questions at all, please feel free to ask. It'd be really good for you to, to you know, ask some, ask some questions about control. Stanford. Um, yeah, I really encourage everyone to join in as well, because I have to be honest, I'm feeling a little bit nervous about this topic. As Colin remember, I'm quite resistant or try to control the circumstances by not talking, not picking this topic myself. Um, so, yeah, I have some perspective and I have some views on what control is, what it isn't, how it's working in the medical system and how it affects our psyche. But sorry, I think I've cut you off, Colin. You've got a question for me, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, how? what's your view of the concept of trial? I like your definition with regard to how you can order something or to limit something um, to... Because I find that quite interesting because for me, when you use the word to order, to limit, it's almost like it's a tamasic quality. Um, it's a tamasic quality, and tamas is about inertia. Um, it's about structure. It opposes movement. So in a way, control is something that opposes movement within yoga concept. But also for me, within this, the idea of control means that there needs to be some idea of something that is using an intelligence to actually idea, have an understanding of what it is that is being controlled as well. So there's got to be some intelligence there. There's got to be some sort of um, something else, some sort of movement that you're looking to flow or to, to get in place, to get some control, and also some sort of intelligence behind the whole thing. So for me, these sort of three things come together. 
Um, so I liked it when you said to order or to limit, because actually it really gives me an idea about actually this is the nature. One of the natures of the universe is to actually have control. And I think I got a few definition about it. And that the one that I gave was kind of the most encompassing. It has most aspect, but there's another really basic definition of control, which is kind of like a switch. And mm -hmm. I find that really super, super interesting because when you think about control, it can be as simple as like a mechanical switch where you press on one button, something goes up, press another button, something goes down. And you're right in saying it's very, it can, it can give a sense of very tematic, very inertia. But at the same time, I think that's a flip side of that, which is with one action, you can go into something quite, in the yoga sense, rajasic, something very, very movement. It's almost like a little bit of an all or nothing scenario. And I'll give the example of birth control, because I used to work in maternity, where contraception sometimes is, you know, the, the, the terminology of the, or of the technology is called birth control, because there's almost a sense of either having nothing where you don't get pregnant, or you're having fertility. And there is the sense, as soon as someone come off the contraception, I should be able to be fertile again. And we often do see that in clinic. And actually, as you said, that in the reality of it, it's slightly less clean cut. Sometimes with certain method, it takes a little bit of time to return. Sometimes you get it straight away. Sometimes actually the effect is slightly longer lasting. So there, there is this sense of actually you can call, use an action to effect or affect the body and the organism. But we are unfortunately or fortunately not quite machinery where it can go either zero or hundred. That there is this not so linear relationship sometime. So in effect, what you're saying is in, in order to have control, there needs to be an action in place that you're looking to control. So something like birth control, you've got the process which is actually happening in the first place. So there is this kind of process that's going on. So we've got a process that's happening. And when you put um, birth control in place, you actually limit or you look to order that process that's happening. Make sense? So this for me is very much Rajas and Tamas working together in yoga. And so Rajas is, is the basis or underlying basis of all movement. And Tamas is this limiting force that happens as well. So the two have to work together. And I think what we're doing is we're actually laying the foundation here to understand just something a little bit more, which is about when we get the imbalances of control. I mean, because those become the interesting areas is that we actually don't notice about control unless it becomes imbalanced. Does that make sense, Sanford? And so when you're talking about sort of birth control, having, you know, as a, as a psychiatrist and as a medical doctor and working obstetrician, which you've done really successfully, you kind of, you've, found yourself in situations where what's happening is that someone goes on birth control so they actually pray and put a control into the system but this has a knock-on effect because it starts to affect the way that the actions of the system are actually coming to work so you get numbers of different lots of people get different reactions to birth control pills don't they so when we put a control in place you get and, and do you know do you mind just quickly a, a few of the different um, outcomes of those things so you can get um, skin conditions yeah well so first of all hopefully it means you don't get pregnant um yeah. some people still get regular periods depending on type that you get some people actually start getting really irregular periods or no period at all it can affect your skin for some people it affects your mood because there's a change in the hormonal balance um yeah, so that, that's quite a few things. So sometimes it may even may be a more physical symptoms as well. Sometimes it can affect the breast a little bit as well. Or um, in some ways we use it as a treatment for like something like ovarian cysts. So there's quite a few direction where the control can affect. And it all very much depends on the person, really. There's no right or wrong or the best way. Um, it's a lot of time, it's like a trial and error. Right. It's this absolutely amazing what you've just said. And the reason I'm saying that is kind of interesting because you've really touched on something that actually is very exciting is that in order for a system to work naturally in the first place, it has to have actions that are going on that are being controlled. 
So in fact, you've got a system that has control, which is the rules associated with how the system's working. So in order for there to be ovulation um, and a period and this sort of movement, there is numbers of different rules that happen and they're all controlled. You know, it's 28 days per cycle. There is an accumulation that happens. There's an elimination that goes on. You, you see that actually all of it, we, you know, when we ask a question to someone, we turn around and say, you know, how's your menstrual cycle? Um, and they say, you know, it, it's regular. And you'll say, well, what do you mean by regular? And they'll say, well, it's 30 days. And you'll think to yourself, well, 28 days is regular. This is a little longer. Then you'll ask them another question to say, well, is it always like this? And they'll say, well, no, sometimes it's 30, sometimes it's 28. And then you'll ask a question, how long is your period? Is it you know, four days or is it six days? And they'll say, oh, it's it kind of, it, it starts off this way and it goes this way. And what you start to do is you get a sense about how the natural control is within the system of the body, whether that's a regular control or whether it's an irregular control. And is it irregularly regular or is it irregular, irregular, which means that we actually have to start to kind of pay attention to it. And so what I just love, what you just said, Stanford, is that actually by putting medication into the system, which is another control, you put the control on top of the control, the natural control that's there, and then you can see the that actually the impact on this affects the other control systems within the system. Do you see what I mean? So that's why we get the skin problems. That's why we get the emotional problems. That's why we get all these other things, because actually as part of these natural controls that are in place, they have associations with other functions that are going on in the system. I think it's fascinating. Thank you for that. That's really kind of, it's actually quite a, kind of interesting because it kind of sort of starts to explain about this idea about how we can use medication or not use medication, how this control becomes a limit in one way, but it creates knock-on effects in another way. And what's so interesting about how you said, how you explain less uh, using the example of birth control is a control on the existing control is it, any scientific studies or experiments or a very good well-designed scientific study and experiment there should always be something called the control sample so the control sample is a sample that you don't do anything with so that's the sample that's kind of like the baseline where the existing environmental factor is already there maybe it's the age maybe it's genetic maybe it's whatever normal distribution there may be in the sample and then there's the experimental sample where you put the extra effects on it where um then you measure that any change of outcome or the desirable effects or side effect whatever the experiment is designed for against the control sample what you said was interesting because now it kind of almost explained that term a little bit is a control sample because measuring what the baseline control is with the nature on the population and whatever else is added on top that's the experiment because obviously that's what we are trying to affect on it but i i think i think that is a very good way in some way to think about what control really is is there is a natural order of things almost where there's a natural sequence and progression or aging um, in one's lifetime in the world, in, in, in time in general. And then that's something that we can do. And I think almost when we say being having control or being in control, having the sense of being in control, is almost like we are then on top of it, having some sort of, I don't want to use the word control because you really shouldn't use the word to define itself, um, but to have some ability to affect um, what is existing and also to achieve a desirable effect or avoid undesirable outcome. And I think in some way, when I was looking into this psychologically, is it also kind of like talking about a comfort zone? You know, if you always do the same thing over and over again, it's almost like an experiment. You know what is going to be coming out of it. So that's why, oh, that's great. If I don't change it, then I always have the desirable effect. So in the sense, when we when I talk to my patients, sometimes that is almost like the comfort zone. And sometimes there's, there's the need of change and coming out of it and almost being having the sense of out of control just to see an experiment, what will happen. And as you said, these experiments are important because th there are ultimately times where there's a pandemic in the world, there is a economic crisis, there's a war happening somewhere where ultimately we really do not have control we can't really really can't control those factors for most of us 
So actually almost having a little bit of like that experiment where we are out of our comfort zone, maybe is important. Interesting. Really interesting because it, it, what, what highlights to me is there's, there's unconscious controls, there's control mechanisms that are happening in place, such as cycles of things. Um, these are, so the operation of your body at this moment in time, how that's functioning, how you're breathing. And if you think about the systems of the body, there's only one system you can exert control over. Out of the 11 systems, you can only exert some level of control over the respiratory system. Now, I, and, and, and I remember in yoga, we just don't look at the body, we're looking at the mind, but we also look at spirituality as well. And I think the mind, when we get onto this in a minute, it's going to be quite interesting with regard to control. But I'm kind of interested with regard to the word control. And I, I've had a number of problems with the word control in yoga. And because what happens is that a lot of people tend to push and they tend to push and they tend to push very hard or they tend to over control because they use the word control for them means to grasp, to hold, to grip, to squeeze, to push, to be in charge of. And actually, when we're looking at controlling something or someone else, we exert that kind of force within it. And so why I'm starting with the body is that when in yoga, quite often people come to physical practice, first of all. And one of the promises within physical practice is to be able to have control over your body. And people that look at control as being a way of actually pushing and pushing and pushing as much as possible, how far they can take their body, how much they can do. And actually, I think that a level of control is not about how much you can do. It's about being able to direct or to manage something. So the aspect of playing out on the body, you're looking to direct your breath, not control your breath. So if you're controlling your breath, you're squeezing it very, very hard indeed. If you're directing your breath, you step back from it and you actually become into a healthy relationship with it. So I think that when we're exerting or putting a control in place, like, a, like you mentioned with regard to birth control, we're putting something in place. It has to work in the right way. If what happens is the force is too hard, there's huge knock-on effects, massive knock-on effects. And I think that actually what we're looking at with regard to this is the capacity consciously when we're starting to work with the body to put into place different tools and techniques which operate on the body is to start to put in place careful direction which is like an experiment you know so you have the you understand the control place that you're in you then put something into the system and you observe and see the force that you're using and the effect and the outcomes that are happening the problem is is most of us aren't aware of the effects and the outcomes that are happening does that make sense, Stanford? Yes, I'm also smiling because I think what you said really like resonates with what Lauren is saying as well about the weather in Kansas City. Like when the force is almost too forceful, you feel really out of control and you you don't you don't get a sense of stability. And I was thinking what you're saying as you were saying that there's also a sense of having control is having having the right amount of control is being carefully led. Um, I say that because in my medical specialty training, so once we actually graduated and had a foundational training and become fully qualified doctor, we joined a specialty and we are led by consultant and as well as guidelines, which are most of the time evidence-based or and as well as experience-based. And as we progress, like say in Optin Gyne, obstetric in gynecology, seven years of training in psychiatry is six years of training. And what happened in those years is every year we kind of get certain assigned task let's say we have to do an uncomplicated um cesarean section start to finish um or we have to see a patient from for psychiatric review start to finish or lead a ward round so, so like you know these are a few of the examples and over time these tasks get more and more complex and the more and more we have to have the competency to do them supervised but almost independently we have to be able to do them more and more and in a lot of sense it's kind of like what you were saying it's a very very gradual process where over the years that we are in training 
we we got given that autonomy, that that ability to use the evidence ourselves or to use our experience to then kind of not control the situation, but kind of direct what is happening, direct what we're trying to affect. That is that is definitely something I really resonate with, especially with my medical training, because that that's kind of almost like the model. Um, Bella is asking: Is control just an illusion which creates suffering? So I have an idea. Let's Go jump back and answer this. Then we'll come back to this later. I promise you, um, because I think that let's keep working with the physical structure and understanding the function of the physical structure. Look at the senses, and then maybe look at the mind, because I think that there's aspects of control with regard to the mind. Because remember, we're we're coming to look at um, the relationship we have with ourselves, relationship we have with the world, the environment's impact on us the other people's impact on us and our impact on other people with regard to control. Now, the question about control and illusion, I think let's come back to because it's, it may be a very different idea beyond these things. Okay, so uh, let's, let's, let's lay this and then we can propose some other ideas with regard to control. Okay, happy to. Um... Sorry, Della. I didn't mean to do that to you. I'm just uh... so physical wise. I think the, the other example I'm thinking of is almost like a condition that we want to have a very well control of. That like a chronic condition where let's say the blood pressure is going haywire or the blood sugar is going haywire, like in diabetes. Then you want to or eye pressure going haywire in a glaucoma case, and you want to have a well control over physical structure, where you use medication, where maybe you use diets and exercise, and these are the things that we see as positive. Mm. Yeah. In, in yoga and Ayurveda, the, the automated control of the system is managed by a sub... It's a, it's a, it's a sub area it's a sub function of our life force um and when it works well it works really well when it goes wrong we actually feel that the automated processes get agitated and that's where we get an understanding that it goes wrong and the tools of yoga and also ayurveda are used specifically to affect these sub functions of our life force so for example if i if i give an idea about this is that does anyone get twitchy eye? You know twitchy eye? You know when you get that kind of twitchy eye thing? Well, you've got twitchy eye. So this is an aggravation of an, an energy which is around here, according to yoga. Now, if you put a chamomile tea bag over the eye, okay, which is wet, moist, calming, it sorts and helps with this. So, in fact, it becomes a tool that you use to actually pacify what's going on. And it helps for the, to get control back onto what's the natural control back into where it should be. Does that make sense? So, it means that all the tools of yoga, all of them, they have, they're like you're actually using them, putting them into the system to create an effect onto the system. So, any kind of position any kind of breathing technique will affect the way that this, the, the natural order of the way that all the controls in the system work. So it either goes along with them or it can aggravate them. And a job of a therapist, a good therapist is to choose the right tools and techniques which help to get the controls, natural controls working back into the system alongside Western medical approach. Does that make any sense, Stanford? So I think it's kind of, I think it's really interesting what you just said. And I, I, you know, we only feel that these automated processes, you know, that we take for granted, uh, uh, we only feel them when they start to either clash with each other. So you actually start to get sort of constipation or they start to fail or they get disrupted or they get disturbed or they get vitiated. And what we tend to do is when that happens is we tend to, run around as much as possible to try and put controls in place in order to get things back onto tracks where they should be. So yoga is very, very interesting. 
really interesting because it's looking at the whole body. It's looking at the natural controls in the body. It's looking at the tools of yoga as tools that directly affect all the different functions, whether it's physical or whether it's psychological or whether it's spiritual. And you use those and apply them directly. in. And that's what I find absolutely fascinating about it. It means that I can affect the digestive system. I can use different techniques to affect different parts of the body in different ways, different parts of the mind in different ways, dependent on the tool or technique. So they become almost in a way, they become like a technology or they become like an actual control that gets put into place to change the flow or the pathway of something or to unblock something that is blocked. Does that make any sense? Yes. And this is now really much reminding me of our chat on flatulence and yawning where the, oh, there's right. natural <laughs> methods. Exactly. And you don't control them. You, you, if the body's doing something, you let them do it. And in right. some way, just because winter is coming and there's norovirus season coming as well. And sometimes that's also kind of what we tell our patients, especially with vomiting and diarrhea, obviously to the extent that it's not really compromising the, the the basic function of your body so say unless you are elderly or very young children or have immunocompromised where you can't kind of go into dehydration severe dehydration and shock we actually kind of just let the body run its course and just let the body eject out whatever is causing the issues and then we're just trying to keep the hydration going keep it comfortable as much as you can and then let the body heal afterwards so actually yeah you're absolutely right we try we will try to pacify thing, but we try not to as much as we can stop the body doing what it needs to do. Um, yeah, so I resonate with that. Thank you. I, I, I think I also look at the way that we've got these senses of action in yoga. So the capacity to have our speech. And if you think about it, is that, and I love it, you and I, do you remember when we sat down and we were having a chat about being born um, about two years too early? Yeah, you know, actually, we, we're kind of like we're the only mammals that actually are, are we have to learn how to communicate. So we have to get some level of control. We learn about control. We have to learn how to use our hands. We don't know how to use our hands. We have to learn how to use our hands. We have to learn how to use our legs to move in space. We have to, you know, we have the, the action of the genitals to pleasure ourselves and to reproduce and also the use of the anus and bladder to eliminate. And these are the mechanisms that we have to learn to get a control over and it's interesting that actually you know how early in life we start to learn to get control over these senses and i also find it very interesting that we get that control we then it becomes very automated and then what happens is that and I've been working with a number of cancer patients who are cancer survivors. And there is a real deep sense, deep, deep, deep sense of a loss of control and a grieving around what's happened within the systems of their body. The fact that, you know, there's a, a one lady I'm working with who's a stoma bag. And, and actually, it, it's like, actually, there is no control over this aspect which she had control over. It's so interesting. Does does that make sense, Sanford? Yes. And sometimes it's just that mentality of losing control can be very limiting. Um, you talk about cancer survivor. I remember there was a patient that I worked with where there was an injury. I think it was a bike injury or something where the person got hurt. But actually, physical structure-wise, there was no damage. There might be a little bit of bruises. But then what clearly has happened is because of the pain and the shock of the accident, there's a shock in the system where that's the confidence almost being knocked back. So that's a, it took a lot of reassurance, almost uh, a lot of maybe scans or examinations or repeated working with specialists just to reassure there is actually nothing wrong with the structure. And yes, at the moment, maybe it's about the shock of the accident itself that is causing the limitation. Maybe that's the, the, the limitations more men on the mental level. And then it mm. took quite some time for the function to be gained back because it was interesting that even though there's nothing broken, that the, the movement you can see was actually quite, quite limited. Interesting. Really interesting because in yoga, we, we break the mind into several areas, as you know. One is the 
the mental area for managing the functions of the system. So it, it manages the the senses that we take information and get information in, and it manages the system and processes of being able to express things out into the world and, and does the switching with regard to this. So in one way, it's unconscious um, and it's unconscious and unconscious. It's like automated in a way. But then we've got another area, which is too much to do with an intellectual area, which actually does some processing, thinking, making sense of things. And then we've got this area of identity where we have parameters of what we identify with and have deep reference points for who we think we are and how we present ourselves and how we manage the beliefs we have into the world. And so what we start to see is that when we're looking at control, we start to see how we put in place certain rules and those rules that we put in place and those identities that we put in place create pathways which actually we use to control the movements of things. So we started this conversation looking at an action that needs to be or have a direction within it, which is the controlling aspect within it. But if this is not just happening within the body, it's also happening within the mind. It's also happening deep within the belief system within each of us as well. And this is what yoga is looking at, is, is looking at the roots and the pathways that we take and the limiting actions that we come to put on things and the controls that we put in place. And so when there is a traumatic incident, sometimes there is numbers of different things that are going on, huge numbers of things going on. And it could be that it's re-triggered something from the past. It could be that what's happening is that it's put someone in a position where uh, other things have come up for them, or it could be that this is how they're dealing with the trauma of the situation. They need to actually go through and actually release this trauma, but they're holding on to it. So it, it's, it becomes, there becomes numbers of things which come up for people, especially with regard to their identities and with regard to their beliefs. Now, if you think about it, it's why we get numbers of different issues. So if you take a situation like COVID and lockdown, which we've all experienced, we've had some people, I've met some people who've said they've had the best time of their life during this. There was a control exerted from outside, which said, you can't leave your home. You mustn't do this. You mustn't do that. And they stayed at home with their families. They had the best time ever. Other people, the, the control was exerted and their experience was completely the opposite. It was the biggest disaster in their life. And it actually created isolation, knock on effects into their lives, depression, do you, do you see what I mean? So that in fact, what we have is we've got these controls that are put in place, which are, we have a way of working. Our society is like an organism. It works in a natural way. And suddenly you put a limiting control in place and it creates huge knock-on effects. And the experience is different for each person. Do you see what I mean? And, and so when we start to look at the mind, and we're just beginning to begin to sift into this, because I want to give ideas about this a little more. Does that, does that make sense, Dan? Yes, and I think the pandemic is such an interesting example of a control because there was the government or state or health organization exerting the control on mass population. Mm. But what you said earlier on about relationships is not just us within ourselves, within the world, but also with other people. Mm. When you talk about that control aspect of the relationship, I also, well, as a psychiatrist and also as a clinician, that's also a controlling aspect of I don't know, romantic, maybe sometimes familial, or maybe friendship relationship that it's sometimes very, very difficult to think about rather the healthy or unhealthy. Because me and a colleague was just talking about this earlier on today is how do we view control in relationship in Western medicine? Because mm. it's a very difficult definition because there's not a certain way we practice. There's not a certain way we've been taught how to have the healthiest relationship in a lot of sense, because it's different for everyone. We can't know what the utmost unhealthy relationship look like, which is when you kind of lose the autonomy. You don't have any sense of say or idea what is going on. But then there is also always caveat, because there are some people who actually enjoy that kind of relationship and they are happy with it. So I, 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 find, I find the controlling aspect of relationship with other people very very difficult because it's one is very very based on each and every individual 
is based on based on our functionality. Mm. It's based on our aspiration, personality, and also a lot of the time what our look and culture is. Because if we've been raised, certain part of life is being controlled by other people. Let's say, I'll use the example of arranged marriage. Certain culture actually, it is normal. It's completely acceptable and actually appreciated that your parents arranged a marriage for you and I have talked to a colleague recently who said actually that was good because my parents they can have a very open honest opinion they're older they can see further into the future they understand they know what quality they're looking for in a partner for me and they're actually very happy with it was then the colleague's sister actually really really unhappy because they don't think they have the autonomy to make those choices so it is it is very difficult I find to give that definition it's it's a very interesting case because it reminds me of a case I had this week. Um, uh, a, a client comes, she read my book and said, I need some help. And it, she'd been a, just got into a relationship for a year and a half. And they were talking about marriage and having children. And she said, I just feel that all of this is getting out of my control. And I'm really, really frightened. It's bringing up a lot. I feel very claustrophobic I feel very um oppressed I just want to run away I, I'm saying one thing on the outside but underneath I'm screaming I'm I'm do, do, does this make sense Stan it's kind of interesting because you've you've got the like you say with culture you've got these these different things happening on the one side you've got kind of like a very much an acceptance and arranged marriage on the other side you've got two people that are coming together that love each other but actually that intimacy brings lots of things to the surface and one person views that the you know more and more intimacy more and more vulnerability as imposing on their freedom and control you know and then they're posing the question you know well can I you know what kind of mother will I be you know can I actually go ahead and do this you know so it's, do you see what I mean so it's it's kind of interesting and just like what we talked about in boundaries, it, it changes as well, according to circumstances, according to what we're facing with. Um, suddenly, I just realized this is this episode is probably going to be a very good trailer for all the other ones. <laughs> um, another another area that I looked into, which I found most fascinating, and of course, I save it to the last, is actually how we try to control our environment. I looked into it because as I said at the beginning, I, I find it fair. I find myself quite resisting to talk about control because I, I don't feel as comfortable talking about this. There's not a lot of evidence based sometimes. There's not a lot of treatment I can talk about. Maybe not as much condition I can talk about that we haven't talked about before, like OCD. But actually, I started thinking about infection control, like how you mentioned about the pandemic. It's a really big thing nowadays about mask, about hand hygiene or face covering, I should say, as well as medication. Are we using vaccination? Are we using antiviral drugs? Are we using antibiotics? Are we using steroids? So infection control is such an interesting thing because we, it is almost unavoidable that we have infection because we are constantly communicating with the external world. We have a lot of bugs, bacteria inside our body. There are a lot of bugs and bacteria and viruses and fungus outside our body. And it's almost always a balance, a balance of what works, what doesn't work, how can we suppress some of them, how can we utilize some of them to make it make them work for us. And infections, when that balance get a little bit out of whack. Mm -hmm. So obviously we try to limit it because obviously it affects our life. The interesting part is then I start thinking about where did most infection come from? Because that is interesting because I don't know where a COVID come from. I don't think any scientists can say for sure right now, but I come from Asia. So we had a lot of avian flu in that part of the world. I kind of, I kind of grew up with lots of different variants of avian flu, uh, flu and SARS and things like that. And just like the name suggests, it come from birds. It come from our proximity to birds. Because I remember back in a certain part of my childhood where avian flu is really, really bad. In the wet market, they actually have to take all the livestock away and actually term terminate them because it's just not safe for them to be in the wet market so close to the community and to children and to old people who do their daily grocery shopping there anymore. And, that, and then actually, if we're looking into agriculture, actually a lot of the infection are come from that, like anthrax, bovine TB, 
CJD, Campylobacterosis, E. coli, and some uh, strands of Streptococcus. And it, it was interesting because, so we exert a certain control in the environment, like agriculture, because we want to have more food so that we can feed all the population. But then it caused the problem, it caused infection. And then now we have to exert another control, infection control, or antibiotics, or vaccination, or I don't know, lockdown to get an effect. And then afterward, we have to most likely exert another control to deal with the effects. So I thought that was very, very interesting because this one is a very medical example, but also at the same time, very almost philosophical one. And at each stage, there are different variables that can everything can go wrong at. I was talking to a farmer just this morning who was having TB testing today. And he said, it's really bizarre because when you TB test um, a cow, you do two samples on the neck. And so they do two samples on the neck, but they don't change the needle in between each of the samples. So you go around the whole herd and you actually use the same needle for the whole thing. If you drop it onto the ground, you pick it up and you wipe the needle on your on, on your jacket and continue. So the, the, it, it, it's not like a human is that we change all the needles all the time. We, we are very careful with things. And here, what he was saying is that actually sometimes you can get a false reading. And when you get a false reading, they destroy the animal. And then what they do is they test the animal and they often discover that the animal didn't have it and it was just a false reading. And you just wonder why all these things are happening. And so at each different level, when you put controls in place, there is a number of other decisions that need to be put in place with regard to those controls. And it's very, very, very fascinating. Very fascinating. Um, with regard to control issues, often our behavior changes when we become frightened, doesn't it? And so what we look to do is we look to exert control over the things that we believe that we can have control over. So it means that quite often you find that people exert control over their environment. So OCD, they're looking to create order and control in a particular environment. Um, someone is controlling or a control freak exerting control over another person so there is a, an aspect of control that's going on because of, of some imbalance within them does that make sense so what we start to see is we start to see numbers of other things that are happening we start to see that when there are imbalances that are going on within a person within a system within an environment and how the person comes to identify with that the patterns that they have in place they start to create different let, let's call it different behaviors and quite often these behaviors are built on fear i i remember that reminded me of a student i taught which um because i used to work in maternity i also get sometimes quite a few a uh, student who would then become pregnant and want to continue with their yoga practice. I'm sure you have had the same thing where they come to me, they are going into second trimester. They're very happy to come back onto the mat and do more physical based practice. And then a lot of the time, the question that I got asked is, can I go back into my inversions? Like this student that I have in mind is because she will have work, been working so hard on her upper body strength and mobility and flexibility so that she can get into really beautiful handstands and uh, headstands and so on and so forth. And she's like, I work so hard onto these things. I really, really want to keep them. And the session ended up being a quite, quite a lengthy discussion about why she wanted to carry on with the handstands and the inversion. Because I think she knew when she came to me, it's like, most medical advice and I think most yoga teachers would advise maybe in pregnancy inversion or quite a strong inversion like handstand probably is not advised just because it's not the safest thing to do hmm. and after some like kind of long chats and a lot a lot of tea it got to it was like but I've been working so long for this I want to really really keep it I was like well that sounds very very valid and I almost didn't have any answer and then it's like 
but then you choose to be pregnant. You just told me how much you're looking forward to be pregnant and to become a mother. And you work also on that for some time as well. And you know, and you have a good understanding that it's this pregnancy itself, like you say, is a transformation. You know, you, you are naturally going into a transitioning to a different stage of life. So actually, in one side, you 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 are willing and you're wanting and happy to transform and trans transition, but on the other hand, you're really really trying to grab hold of certain things that like there's that old part of you, and I guess that the, the real discussion and argument is how much do you want to actually transform and transition to the next phase, and how much you want to grab hold of the old self, because it's it's fascinating because you're frightened of you're frightened of losing what you have right now which is a definition of fear losing what you have right now which is this ability to do handstands and all these other bits of pieces and the identification you actually create with all of those and the fear of the unknown which is actually i'm going to move forward and become a mother and it is absolutely mind-blowingly painful the whole process really is because it, 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 who holds our hand? There's just so many mixed messages, so many uh, different ideas, and we're told, and we ought to, and we should, and we must. And these are all horrible words because they exert control over us in a place and time that we actually need to be more free than ever to be able to feel, to breathe, to be vulnerable, to be in touch with ourselves. In a sense, like you said before, is to, to, to have the ability to direct, but not to hold tightly and kind of grasping is, is to be able to have the autonomy. I, I really always really like that word is to have the faculty to understand the information that was given to you to, to retain the information, because that's important too, to have the memory for that, and then to process the information so you can have your own opinion and decision and to have the ability and to feel comfortable enough to actually explain your decision to other people to have the capacity and to use that capacity to like kind of make decision all day long i think that autonomy part of us is very very important and i think it's well probably because of my medical training because it's a very very important part of our medical practice where like say someone's coming to me and wanting to have a certain treatment the option is always we have to explain all the available option, like obviously not all the weird and wonderful is all the widely known available option that is reasonable to that patient, as well as probably affordable, their risk, the benefits, and then also then give them the time to actually understand, to absorb the information, to ask any questions, and then to have the time and not pressure into making decisions. But I think, as you said, it's very, very, it's getting almost more and more difficult every day. I was just playing on my phone, you know, getting ready for this webinar. Um, and I was doing browsing my social media and actually out of two of the different platforms, the same advert keep coming up again and again and again. And I, I always I have to go into the uh, function of like, can you stop showing this advert to me? Because is I almost feel like sometimes information is being, we are being bombarded by the information. We're bom being bombarded by a certain view. And it's, it takes a certain strength to say, no, actually, I don't want to see this anymore. I want to see something else different. And maybe then I want to have a choice. It's just, it's just as you said, it's difficult. It's scary. It's not easy. It isn't. And what this reminds me of, it sounds very bizarre, but this reminds me of the meditation process. It's very, very, very strange because the meditation process, it begins with you looking to create an increased amount of control in a particular direction. So there has to be effort, which is directed in a particular direction. In order for that focus to change from being control and focus into meditation, I need to let go of the control aspect. And then there's a flip into a meditative state. And it means that meditation is something that you do not do. It's something that actually happens. 
And in a way, meditation is beyond control. And it's the point beyond control that actually becomes very exciting, becomes autonomous, as you use that beautiful word. It's, it's a very important area. And so when you're just saying that, is that it, it, the nature of our minds, the nature of everything we do is to grasp things. We want to know how. How do I do that? How do I do this? We intellectualize everything. Okay, we look to limit and control things in lots and lots of different ways. But actually, a meditative state is a very natural process. It's a process actually beyond these areas, a process where we reduce effort, where we step back, where we enjoy space, where we direct, we're in charge rather than control, and whether we're where we're involved yet not involved within everything that's happening. So I really like um I really like what you just said there because it, for me it's just it's exactly the meditative process. Yeah and, and what you said just remind me of the, the example of children that you said like how we grow up and how we learn things. Mm. As you said we, we human brain is so well designed towards categorizing things and classifying things because it makes it more comfortable to learn black and white as just having black and white because it's easy as either a or b and as mm -hmm. we grow older, and i think we all have that same struggle or same lesson or same beautiful learning that actually a lot of time things are gray like you said it's in the middle it's is in the mm -hmm. space in between the categories in the space between the different classes actually then to enjoy the space and then to explore what that space means is really really beautiful and i don't i don't know i think would you say that is the space that is having control or is having the classification, the illusion of having control? Because I really want to come back to Della's question. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Because um, if we take Della's question, is the, is control an illusion? Is, is it, it, to your answer this from a, an Eastern perspective, from a yoga perspective, we're looking to the maximum we can be is fluid and stable within the chaos of the world and comfortable with ourselves. So this means that we act effectively and efficiently into the world. And actually we feel free and happy within ourselves. This is within yoga's terminology. These are, these are the kind of maximum areas. It means that control isn't an illusion. It's actually a tool in order to actually find some aspect of freedom and find some aspect of healthy relationship. This is the first thing. And then when we start to look at different religious perspectives, now in different religious perspectives, we have a, a perspective called, in the East, called Advaita, Advaita Vedanta. And what happens in Advaita is that it, the perspective is that actually everything that you experience in the material world, every single thing is an illusion. And so actually it, it, all of it, everything that you're doing is just a pure, pure, pure illusion and isn't actually real. And in this case, um, the oneness, the connectivity of oneness is one of spirit. And in which case there is no aspect of control whatsoever. All the control we have is an illusion. And that's how I'd answer that as question. Well, as I don't have as well-researched perspective, but I have a personal perspective, which is mm -hmm. I think control is, this, as we've been saying, more like a sense. It's a sense of control rather than actual control. Because I think the example of agriculture and then infection control and then the effects of infection control taught me that yes we can try to control and limit and rule things or affect things but sometimes the effect is not always well known or completely known mm. they either immediately short term or long term it's just not known in a sense it's like an experiment you can try to do something what you get or what we get is it's unknown so the sense of being in control, like the comfort zone, it is not actually a box or a circle or whatever shape you want to create it. It's, it's a sense that you are feeling comfortable in a certain area or certain action or certain pattern. Um, so yeah, I think I think in my view, is that illusion? 
I, I don't know, because that got a bit too close to perception and reality and so forth, so on and so forth. I think it may all, almost be like there would be a good <laughs> another webinar subject to talk about perception and reality. But yeah, from my perspective, it's more like a sense, a sense of being in control. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Um, Stanford, I cannot believe we have talked for nearly an hour on the subject. It's amazing. Yes, I can't what, believe what, it myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what what's what's come out of this for you? What's the what was the thing that you kind of you walk away with from this? I really enjoy your definition and relation between control to meditation and how how it kind of explained the process of meditation or what meditation really is, what that state really meant. I think that really made it more clear for me tonight. What about you? For me, I really like the layers that you put in place with regard to the effects of each interaction we put into ourselves, whether that's a medicine, whether it's a whether it's psychology, whether it's a, any type of intervention that affects the controls we have will create different outcomes. So all I really I've really enjoyed our conversation this evening and I'm Really excited to to see you again in a couple of weeks' time. Absolutely. Um, we'll be excited to talk about, in two weeks' time, masturbation, I think. I think that's the topic we've picked. Or we may change it. Who knows? <laughs> so hopefully we'll get to see you in two weeks. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Stanford. <laughs> Thank you.